The last of the poems in the book, Select English Poems, compiled by Swamiji, is a great epic called uh, Sorabhan Rustum. This is authored by Matthew Arnold. The original epic is in Russia, Persian, and this has been very beautifully translated and in letter and spirit captured by Matthew Arnold. Honestly, what is given here, whether it is the full epic, we really do not know. Because in the beginning of the poem, it says an episode. And if you see the Hindi movie, which is based on this Saurabh and Rustam, I think there is a long uh, background story and everything given, which ultimately culminates in the battle scene. Um, so, if it is an epic, because in our uh, um, in uh, our Indian culture and the civilization, we know of two great epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata. They are actually voluminous and very, very, very big texts. Greek have their own epics, and not only that, in India, apart from uh, these two well-known epics, there are other epics also. Um, in Tamil literature particularly, there are said to be five great epics, they are called as Aim Parankapyam, of which only three are available, two are completely lost. Uh, those two are referred in other literature, that's how we come to know about it and these five epics are said to be the five ornaments of uh, Mother Tamil. Uh, Tamil is... Uh, is visualized as a mother like Bharata Mata, you have like that Tamil is visualized as the mother and she has five ornaments and uh, each of these ornaments add beauty and decorate her in one particular part like that, that's how it is all named also. So these are also epics, grand epics and obviously Ramayana and Mahabharata, they have no comparison. And interestingly, Ramayana and Mahabharata epics are there in other languages also, though Sanskrit is the uh, original. So, when we talk about epics, it is that is how we understand. Uh, so, maybe uh, uh, it is a part of a bigger poem. I, we have not done any research on it, we do not know. But this episode that is given here itself is very voluminous and very, very big. But as far as the theme of the poem is concerned, which Swamiji highlights again and again and again, is the theme of uh, attachment. The last three poems, which are relatively big poems, and this is obviously the biggest of them, the theme is attachment. Ladomia depicted the attachment of wife towards husband. Andrea del Sarto depicted the husband's infatuation towards wife. Saurav and Rustum compared to these two is even more tragic. As we read along we will know. Not only that, the main uh, crux of the poem, which is emotions, is the dialogue between the father and the son, which is captured very beautifully by Matthew or not. So, we can even imagine how the original should have been, but as an English poem, this itself uh, brings out the emotions in a very great way. It is difficult to capture emotions in words. It is difficult to capture even sense perception in words. Suppose uh, you have seen a particular architecture in a particular temple or a beautiful site or eaten a particular sweet, you can describe it to others, but the way in which you have experienced, uh, you may not be able to exactly convey. But since it's a physical perception, you can bring in all the dimensions and qualities as much as possible to explain to the other person. 
but how do we explain emotion in words it's not possible as the emotions gets deeper the words uh, fail any emotion for that matter positive or negative deep love deep gratitude extreme anger extreme jealousy all this will maybe change your body language it will change your demeanor but words stop even as you try to express the words stop but obviously even our great epics and uh, other great poets we have seen they do bring out that emotions as you read through the portion or if somebody explains the portion of uh, ramayana let's say when rama searches for sita there's nobody who will not cry as rama is uh, uh, has lost sita and he is searching in the forest Th those are the portions like that uh, similarly uh, tara's uh, lamenting after vali's death or dasharatha's pleading various emotions like that uh, are depicted here is uh, also a very beautiful depiction of emotions so um, swami always says that when you go through this poem you have to only not stop and explain you have to only just read through the poem it is beautifully captured and obviously like a long any long epic it goes into various details which may not be of any consequence for us uh, he is explaining let us say the 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 story is like this this is uh, based on an incident which is uh, supposed to have happened 5 6 centuries before the common era um rustum was a great warrior he was a commander in chief he was undefeated in a uh, one to one combats he won so much laurels and he was uh, highly revered and respected as a warrior he married daughter of a, a, a small king uh, of azerbaijan and uh, i forgot the name tamenna or tanime or something and uh, he used to be always uh, always in the war front and uh, much after their marriage his wife conceived and rustum was eagerly waiting for a son to whom he can pass on his knowledge of warfare so even that concept of wanting a son and to pass on to him that had caught up his personality too much actually if you look at this from a normal angle this is quite a natural instinct and a natural desire for every creature i mean to have an offspring and uh, generally when you say <coughs> nature has been uh, what to say it is not biased and it uh, makes sure that uh, there are there are uh, equal population of uh, men and women that is how it has it has designed itself in every creature it is like that the pairs of opposites are very beautifully synchronized and yet traditionally for whatever reasons we are not going into it now there is always a perpetuity or continuity with reference to one's lineage and therefore a desire for son is always there it is across all cultures even in our culture there is a ceremony called pumsavanam then there is another ceremony called simanta these are done when a, a lady is pregnant when she is carrying traditionally the first one has to be done at the by the end of 3 months and the second one by the end of 6 or 7 months but uh, nowadays even as people perform this they combine these two and perform the first one is actually meaning is wishing a son that's how it is now as i said we are not going into the details of it but one of the things you can easily 
easily uh, uh, relate to is that in terms of uh, wanting perpetuity and in terms of continuing in one's own um, tradition, in one's own field of activity or anything, there will be a perpetuity as far as son is there because daughters will get married and go to the other side. That, that's the uh, only thing. So when you want to live on and on and on, it is more so through your son is a general uh, feeling. So that, that's the main thing. And this is cutting across all sets of people. More so with reference to Kshatriyas because the ruler is somebody who will have someone who, who has to take care of the whole kingdom. So there are various other people who are dependent on it. Though there have been successful queens also in the past but in general it is the first son who takes over as the, as the heir apparent as far as the king is concerned. And all the others who are under the Kshatriya umbrella, who can be warriors also, they have everybody, whether it be a trader, whether it be a craftsman, whether it be a priest, whether it be a knowledgeable person, everybody has a positive pride in their pro profession that must be there also. And that has to be perpetuated further. And obviously when it comes to warfare, it is, uh, it is the male who who is supposed to fight. Again here, um, feminists in the modern era may object to, but you can look into various YouTube videos also now, there have been various uh, uh, discussions about it. However, in the Hollywood also they show, uh, what is the equivalent of that, I don't know, in, for men it is called G.I. Joe. G.I. Jane or something like that. So, so uh, like Superwoman, like Superman, that's a Superwoman, like that various um, uh, movies are taken, various cartoons are also presented to um, show them in the same light. But what you must understand is the strength of the woman, even we are talking about physical strength, not mental strength. Strength of the woman is far superior, but it is in some other areas. Strength of the man is superior, but it is in some other areas. This is naturally given. However much a man may be strong, he cannot bear a child. Even in, in England, they made an experiment, uh, not experiment, just for their experience. They tied a very heavy ball to the bottom side of their uh, tummy and tied it to show how women feel when they are carrying the baby inside. And um, even for a... A couple of days also they cannot bear and here for months together, uh, up to 9 to 10 months uh, she is carrying a baby, it requires extraordinary strength actually. That is how nature is designed in all creatures, in in, uh, in animals, in, in everywhere like that it is. Similarly, there is this brutal strength, brut even in the press button comfort of today's warfare, it is just not possible because the brutish uh, physical strength is also um, yeah, something as an extension of what is there uh, inside. Uh, uh, being being emotional is much more natural to a woman than a man. Uh, family and bondage and attachment is much more natural here. That is why in this point we see that there is an attachment of uh, the wife also to the son. But what is highlighted as a tragedy is the, uh, is the father's attachment to the son, not mother's attachment because it is taken to be natural as it is. We see that weakness in Dasharatha also in Ram and Ramayana that how he had this attachment towards uh, son. Otherwise he was such a strong person but when it came to Rama he was, uh, that attachment uh, was, was very much visible. So coming back here, um, Rustum was a, a great warrior and he was attached to this concept of, so this is natural we said, but he was extremely, extremely over attached to the concept that there has to be a son and to that son he has to pass on. So he was earning and very eagerly waiting for it. And he had gone uh, somewhere, somewhere means uh, again in the duties of the warfare only he was somewhere else far off. And uh, in the meantime, um, his wife delivered and it was a son. But for whatever reason, she sent word that it is a daughter. What could be the reason? The reason could be that uh, she was afraid that he will quickly take him away and train him in arms. 
because we also understand that she is a daughter of some sort of a king not maybe a great king but some sort of a king she is wife of a warrior she will also have these uh, qualities of being what is uh, Kshatrani maybe I'm just saying we do not know the details so she will be definitely knowing that the son will be trained that being the case uh, uh, you cannot resist in any way uh, that uh, cub of a lion to not to grow like a lion it will grow like that only but in the immediate fear of attachment what and how we will say and what is the consequences of it all these things do not come to mind at all so we cannot think in terms of the long term consequences short term she, she, she thought that uh, maybe she will have his company maybe she will um, divert him to some other things or whatever it is whatever be the thing or see the thing is what is not given in the poem is whether if she sends a, sends a wrong message to Rustam whether or not he will stop coming back to his home whether she knew it or not that is not given so she cannot be such a cunning and manipulative and a such sort of a person to take a stance like that but what is given in the uh, poem is that she sent word to Rustum that what is born who is born is a girl and Rustum is completely distraught he did not uh, imagine this he was totally uh, you know shaken completely he was in despair and in that despair mode he decided not to come back to his home at all and sort of he retired he did he was not much enthused and inspired to carry on with his uh, uh, with his profession also he has seen enough battlefields, he has seen enough glory and other things like that it is and this news completely broke his uh, heart to, so that's what it is to the extent that he was totally attached to that extent he was completely shattered but Saurabh the son grew up uh, like his illustrious father he was extremely powerful he grew up to be a great warrior and he heard the glory of his uh, father from everybody. Rustam's feats were much known. And uh, the son was also in that way attached to his father and he somehow eagerly waited to meet him. So he would uh, go for uh, all the combats, warfare and then he will uh, search for his father and he will see if there are uh, old enough people who he meets who could be his father like that it is in this process the he belonged to the uh, army of the tartars he, he was a, a great warrior by himself the tartar king afrasia helped him with his army and wherever he went he conquered everybody wherever there was a single combat also he, he conquered everybody and he just marched on and on like that that Rustum is somewhere there in Persia what he is doing where he is gone because that was the last assignment probably he went and he never returned but nobody knows where he is now only Persians knew that he was Rustum and he was there on the other side now this king Afrasia thought of using Saurabh to conquer Persia that was his motivation for the war and Saurabh's uh, motivation is that somewhere maybe he has seen uh, everywhere else and here is one place where he can go and see if he can find his father so in the process uh, Afrasia probably uh, the, the commentary says he knew and he withheld the information that he is on the other side or whatever it is uh, but he was very eager that Persians must be conquered and so uh, if the war is going on and Sora now uh, requests for a one-to-one -one combat because he is sort of having a feeling that in one-to-one -one combat having known his fame also now that uh, Rustum might come and he can seek his father so main focus and aim of Saurabh in and through all this battle is to find out his father he is also very very desperate and uh, and therefore uh, 
this challenge was laid and the challenge had to be accepted by the Persians. Otherwise, it's a shame. And they knew that there's nobody who can match Sora. And they knew that Sora Rustam was uh, camping also nearby. So uh, they uh, somehow persuade uh, Rustum to come to fight. Rustum refuses. He said, I am done with all this thing. Go to hell. Whatever you want to do, you do like that. He was saying. And he is also still carrying on the old memories. And he says, if my son was there, he would be like Rustum. Like that, he was. I, I would be happy to have like a son like him. I will make him uh, represent me and I will go to my father and, uh, you know, lead a happy and retired life. Like that, he, he dismisses. But then, they provoke him and then he agrees to fight. He agrees to fight incognito that his, he will not be known as he is. And then uh, as they approach each other, there is a, see whatever it is, they have this, uh, some intuitive feeling towards each other, both these people, the father and the son, they do not know. The Persians know who he is, but they are camped on this side of the river, they are camped on that side of the river and there is a vast plain of the sands that is there in between and uh, only these two are coming in between and they are going to fight. So just as they say that the blood is thicker than the water, there is some feeling that both of them have. Um, Rustum feels a, a great pity for this uh, youth. And then he makes an offer that come over to our side, you can be like my son and you continue, I will, uh, you know, why are you with the Tartars, you can achieve much more glory. Here he offers everything for him with uh, a genuine intention only. Saurabh comes and kisses him in the feet and he says, uh, this type of a magnanimity probably only my father only can have and uh, he says, uh, he asks him, are you Rustum? Mm. Rustam is, uh, at this point of time, he uh, he thinks, but he thinks uh, negatively as to why he is asking like this and he gives his own reason. Uh, he is, and then um, he says, uh, forget about all these things. You think that you can uh, challenge Rustam. I have known Rustam. Uh, he says, uh, therefore, uh, you fight here. Uh, you don't uh, talk. Uh, either you uh, give you a chance, you can come to our side or uh, you will be finished. So, Saurabh says, uh, you know, I have also come here to fight only, but you say at least, uh, you know Rustum, let us make peace. You talk to me about Rustum, he is very earnestly pleading. You will have enough uh, people on our side to fight, I will have enough people on your side to fight, let the fighting happen later, but you talk to me about Rustum, he pleads. And uh, this he he thinks there is some sort of a trickery or uh, cunning nature of Saurabh is what Rustum thinks and uh, he is not yielding and then uh, a fight ensues and in the fight uh, first time uh, Rustum falls down because deftly Saurabh moves away from uh, his attacks and he is now very very uh, ashamed, uh, sort of his ego is hurt. In, in, in front of all the warriors, he has fallen down. So therefore, he is now enraged. And then the fight happens in a very big way. A great uh, battle happens between them. Saurabh is uh, winning. And Saurabh is, and this type of uh, enemy, uh, Rustum has never combated in his whole life. So in order to inspire himself, he shouts in the middle of the battle, come on Rustum, Rustum, he shouts. Once Saurabh listens or hears that name, he is completely paralyzed. He drops his shield and is transfixed. And when he is unarmed like that, Rustum pierces the javelin, the spear, and uh, he kills Saurabh. That is the most tragic part. Uh, and then uh, he falls on the ground and uh, Rustum taunts him and, uh, with various words. So you have to see how the emotions change there. First it is of extreme enmity and anger and uh, Saurabh replies back and then finally he says uh, uh, you have killed an unarmed foe but your days are counted. My death will be avenged by my father Rustum he says. 
and first time rustum is hearing something but he doesn't want to believe he uh, he dismisses the whole thing and uh, though sorab is talking various things that he knows uh, uh, the uh, the place and the other um, you know areas and where he came from everything he is not ready to believe and he says what are you saying uh, rustum never had a son he only had a daughter and he thinks that he might have uh, you know got this message from others or something or he he thinks himself to be rustum's son so that he can feel great or something various thoughts run into his mind but sorab is uh, not yielding at all he is uh, vehement and he says and he is uh, countering him back with all sorts of uh, arguments now rustum is slowly pencil and finally he says if uh, you are uh, really rustum's son you will bear the seal which is there in the lineage of rustum which is a particular uh, animal seal tattooed on the on the arm sorab says i do not know why i should show to you but you are right and he shows that the moment he sees that rustum is completely shattered and he is he is he is falling on the ground and his emotions completely changed now here was a father waiting for the son here was the son waiting for the father and when they meet and they know each other the son is going to die you have to imagine that situation so immediately rustum wants to kill himself for the great sin that he has committed sorab understands that and slowly moves and prevents that and what a a deluge of emotions that flow between them is uh, is uh, that what we have read that's that is one of the highlights of the poem and then finally he says that uh, i promise my mother that you will be back so you can uh, bury me and uh, rejoin the mother at least then i'll remain fulfilled uh, in my death like that it ends as a great tragedy but the message here in the poem is interesting we have seen that the mother's attachment to son is there and therefore she doesn't want to let him to warfare everything that can be little more natural also the father is also obviously extremely attached to the son and this is the case with most fathers because the father sees his reflection in the son and it is him only his so son's victory is his victory son's defeat is his defeat that's how it is like that but here is a extreme attachment where the concept of the unborn son itself has preoccupied the mind of rustum to a very great extent and swami ramatirtha says anybody who is attached has to suffer this is a law nobody can escape this law depending on the degree of the attachment that to that extent suffering will be there either the object will be taken away or there will be a rupture in relationship or the person will die he says in that lecture very powerful words uh, for us for us to get it deep into our heart he says it very powerfully like this so that is the um, um, that is the theme here so as we read through you have to just go through the motion of the poem with this not just the motion the emotions of the poem that's all it is and what we need to understand here is that uh, obviously the son was also very eager and very attached see what is interesting here is this is not something negative about it a natural affiliation to the young ones is there in the animal kingdom also it's a positive love to say so to say but in case of animals and other creatures the detachment happens uh, quite naturally also the attachment is there they rear uh, it and it grows up and after that there is no concept of uh, getting the thing married and grandfather and grandmother and uncle and aunt and all those things are not there uh, there is a natural uh, detachment the adult uh, goes away uh, like that so that that's the life of an animal that's the life of a bird we are also designed like that but it has to be done consciously through knowledge it is not having a relationship of a grandfather and grandmother which is unique for human being is something wrong but as you grow along with maturity with knowledge a sense of detachment should come even as you are relating with people and this has to be practiced right from the beginning only 
so therefore the studies in the uh, in the beginning stage of our life is not just to give us worldly knowledge but also guide us towards the permanent aspects of life attached to which we will be able to naturally detach from the worldly samsara this is the method this is the way it is not after the age of 60 it should come it will come automatically or after a tragedy it has to come automatically nothing like that is guaranteed no it is only through knowledge it is only through maturity and for that purpose only intellect is given it is not to probe and probe and uh, in all the areas of the universe and try to be very in your area so that you do that but the main aim of intellect is to develop this sense of uh, yearning for the higher in laramia beautifully words are put us put that be taught o faithful concert um what is that he says a develop a mortal yearning to ascend and for this purpose only love was given love was given only for the purpose of understanding and going towards developing that mukshatva and going towards the higher that is the purpose of being born as a human being otherwise how uh, can we claim ourselves to be any great species than the other species so that is the purpose so therefore uh here was a great warrior uh, two great warriors in fact father and son but uh, uh, at the mental level whatever was their complete uh, weakness in the form of attachment uh, caused this great tragedy we'll read through that uh, poem sorab and rustam the source of this poem is a translation of the shahnameh a Persian national epic by Firdausi, an episode. And the first grey of morning filled the east, and the fog rose out of the Oxus stream. But all the Tartar camp along the stream was hushed, and still the men were plunged in sleep. Saurabh alone he slept not. All night long he had lain, wakeful, tossing on his bed. But when the grey dawn stole into his tent, he rose and clad himself and girt his sword and took his horseman's cloak and left his tent and went abroad into the cold, wet fog through the dim camp to Peran Beza's tent. Through the black Tartar tents he passed, which stood clustering like beehives on the low, flat strand of oxes, where the summer floods overflow when the sun melts the snows in high Pamir. Through the black tents he passed o'er that low strand, and to a hillock came, a little back from the stream's brink, the spot where first a boat, crossing the stream in summer, scrapes the land. The men of former times had drowned the top with a clay fort, but that was fallen, and now the Tartars built there Peran Beza's tent, a dome of lads, and o'er it fence was spread. And Sora came there and went in and stood upon the thick piled carpets in the tent and found the old man sleeping on his bed of rugs and fells and near him lay his arms. And Peran Visa heard him through the step, though the step was dulled, for he slept light an old man's sleep. And he rose quickly on one arm and said, Who art thou? For it is not clearer yet dawn. Speak, is there news or any night alarm? But Saurabh came to the bedside and said, Thou knowest me, Parandiza, it is I. The sun is not yet risen, and the foe sleep, but I sleep not. All night long I lie, tossing and wakeful, and I come to thee. For so did King Afrasia bid me to seek thy counsel and to heed thee as thy son. In Samarkand, before the army marched, and I will tell thee what my heart desires. Thou knowest, if since from the Azerbaijan first I came upon the Tatars and bore arms, I have still served Afrasia well, and shown at my boy's ears the courage of a man. This too thou knowest, that while I still bear on the conquering Tartar ensigns through the world and beat the Persians back in every field, I seek one man, one man and one alone, Rustam, my father, 
who I hoped should greet, should one day greet, upon some well-fought field, his not unworthy, not inglorious son. So I long hoped, but him I never find. Come then, here now, and grant me what I ask. Let the two armies rest today, but I will challenge forth the bravest Persian lords to meet me, man to man. If I prevail, Rustam will surely hear it. If I fall, old man, the dead need no one, claim no kin. Dim is the rumor of a common fight where host meets host and many names are sunk. Both, but of a single combat, fame speaks clear. See, uh, I do not know what they call it in English, but um, in every uh, big epics or even Suppose you take Ramayana, there are say various Kanda, Kanda's uh, the separate uh, portion, right? And each of them is also separated into small, small uh, sequential these things, portions again, small portions you can say. Because Ramayana is like uh, 24,000 verses. Uh, Mahabharata is a uh, and nearly a lack of verses and the entire narration is going to go through it is just not the story various descriptions and each and every description will go in detail like that so here also in this particular episode which is only the battle also there are say various portions that we can split into so he is talking about uh, the initial um, request of Sora to Peran Visa. Peran Visa is the sort of uh, a senior uh, in charge or in sort of a commander and a vice counsel for the Tatar army and uh, their king Afrasia has uh, asked um, Saurabh to take advice and counsel from him. So when everybody was sleeping early in the morning he goes to Peran Visa and he says uh, in my young age also I have shown great courage and I have won various battles for the Tatars and wherever I got a chance from the opposite side if Persians were uh, uh, confronting us from various angles and various other people were helping them each and every time I have sent them back I have defeated them um, that all could uh, be helpful for the king and the kingdom but my motive in the battle is to seek my father which is Rustam. So therefore, in the midst of the war, in the battle, he says, today let not the, let not the, all the people in the armies, uh, they clash with each other. Let us challenge one-to-one -one combat. I will go from our side. So let the Persians send the best of their persons. If uh, a warrior dies and that's the end of the story. No, no big deal about it. If I win, then probably Rustum will hear of it. So that will be a chance for me to meet my father. This is his request. Now what does Peran Visa say? He spoke and Peran Visa took the hand of the young man in his and sighed and said, O Surab, an unquiet heart is thine. Canst thou not rest among the Tartar chiefs and share the battle's common chance with us who love thee but must press forever first in single fight incurring single risk to, a fa to find a father thou hast never seen? That were far best, my son, to stay with us unmurmuring in our tents while it is war and when it is truce then in Afrasiab's towns. But if this one desire indeed rules all to seek out Rustam, seek him not through fight, seek him in peace and carry to his arms, O Saurabh, carry an unwounded son. But far hence seek him, for he is not here. For now it is not as when I was young, when Rustam was in front of every fray. But now he keeps apart and sits at home in Seastan with Zal his father old. Whether that his own mighty strength at last feels the abhorred approaches of old age, or is some quarrel with the Persian king, there, go, thou wilt not. Yet my heart forwards. 
Danger or death awaits thee on this field. Fain would I know thee safe and well, though lost to us. Fain, therefore, send thee thence in peace to seek thy father. Not seek single fights in vain, but who can keep a lion's cub from ravening? And who govern Rustam's son? Go, I will grant thee what thy heart desires. Veran Visa is wishing welfare of Saurabh. So he is saying that uh, when, see I am old and I have seen many battles and in the young age, in every battlefield there will be Rustam. But nowadays he is not seen in any battle, he will not be here. I can understand that you are wanting to seek your father, but do not seek it through this one-to-one -one combat. In peaceful times, you can go and seek him and when you present yourself to him, you will be a full personality, an unwounded son. But now, I feel there is some danger lurking that there might be a death or danger. So I am not for this proposal of yours that uh, there must be there must be one-to-one -one combat. But obviously from the body language of Saurabh, he understands that, that the boy is not yielding at all. So then he says, uh, who can, because he says when you are with us together, the chances of you getting wounded. Suppose if there is a war and something, some, something happens to him. We see in the Mahabharata war also, if somebody is wounded, there is somebody else comes to the rescue and takes him away, like that it is. But in a one-to-one -one combat, there is no chance like that. It's fight to finish, like that it is. So when that is the case, why do you want to take this risk? He feels for him, but then maybe Saurabh looked the other way or whatever it is. He knew that Saurabh was adamant. He was eagerly waiting. He was, that's why he says he is restless like that. And then he says, how can a lion's cub be uh, controlled? Um, and uh, you know, so if uh, Rustum was like that, you will also be like this only. Therefore, I grant you your wish. That is what uh, Peran Visa yields to him finally. Yeah, continue. So said he, and dropped Saurabh's hand, and left his bed, and the warm rugs whereon he lay. And o'er his chimney limbs, his woollen coat he passed, and tied his sandals on his feet, and threw a white cloak round him, and he took in his right hand a ruler's staff, no thought, and on his head he set his sheepskin cap, black, glossy, curled, the fleece of Karakul, and raised the curtain of his tent, and called his harem to the side, and went abroad. The sun by this had risen, and cleared the fog, from the broad oxes and the glittering sands, and from their tents the Tartar horsemen filed into the open plain. So Haman paid. Haman, who next to Peran Visa ruled the host, and still were in his lusty prime. From their black tents, long files of horse they streamed, as when some grey November mourned the files, in marching order spread of long necked cranes stream over Caspin and the southern slopes of Elburz, from the Arabian estuaries or some from Caspian reed bed south southward bound for the warm Persian seaboard, so they streamed. The Tartars of the Oxus, the king's guard, first with black sheepskin caps and with long spears, large men, large steeds, who from Bukhara come and Heva and ferment the milk of mares. Next, the more temperate Turkmuns of the south, the Tukas, the Lances of Salor, and those from Atrak and the Caspian Sands, light men on light steeds, who only drink the acrid milk of camels and their wells. And then a swarm of wandering horse, who came from far and a more doubtful service owned, the Tartars of Fergana from the banks of the Jaxartus, men with scanty beards and close set skull caps, and whose wilder hordes who roam over Kipchak and the northern waste, Kalmuks and the unkempt Kuzaks, tribes who stray nearest the pole and wandering Kyrgyzes who come on shaggy ponies from Pamer, these all filed out from camp to the plain. And on the other side, the Persians formed. First, a light cloud of horse. Tartars, they seemed, the Ilyats of Khorasan, and behind, the royal troops of Persia, horse and foot, 
marshaled battalions bright in burnished steel. But Piran Visa, with his herald, came, treading the Tartar squadrons to the front, and with his staff kept back the foremost ranks. And when Farood, who led the Persians, saw that Piran Visa kept the Tartars back, he took his spear, and to the front he came, and checked his ranks, and fixed them where they stood. And the old Tartar came upon the sand, betwixt the silent hosts, and spake, and said, Farood, and ye Persians and Tartars here, let there be truce between the hosts today, but choose a champion from the Persian gods to fight our champion, Sora, man to man. Okay. This portion obviously is a very great and a beautiful description of all the warriors on both sides. So Peran Misa did not take uh, any weapon like sword, but he took a staff because his purpose of going was not to command or to fight, but to make this main announcement which is in the form of a challenge. So as he goes, all the armies are arranging themselves behind him and uh, the poet describes, probably given in the original also, what are the various uh, order in which the armies are laid and who are the tribes who are there in the beginning, who are there in the middle, who are there in the end. Uh, like that, uh, the description is there and what is that they wore, what are the weapons that they were carrying. So many, so many descriptions are there. Various um, uh, nomadic tribes and others are also part of the army. Like that, it is they have formed the part of this side of the army, which is the Tartars. And on the other side, uh, the Persians were there and they were also quite, uh, you know, a great army and uh, they were having the horse riders in the back like that it was described. Now, when Peran Visa was walking in the, to the front now and uh, he asked all his army commanders and the warriors and every other person there to stop wherever they are and he proceeded forward. The moment Ferud, Ferud is the commander in chief and one of the key persons on the opposite camp. Once Ferud saw that uh, uh, Peran Misa is coming alone with a staff in hand, he also understood there is something that he probably has come to convey. So he makes sure that his army stops. And uh, there is no more marching forward of the armies. Peran Misa goes near them and he makes this announcement that let there be truce between the hosts today. There is no fighting today. But you choose a champion from your side to fight our champion. Our champion is Saurabh. And Saurabh you have to fight one to one. This is our challenge. What do you say? This is uh, Peran Misa's uh, words to Ferud and all the other people who are standing there. Now, what is happening on the other side? Because the moment they heard this, it is not something very easy for them to digest. Uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. As in the country, on a morn in June, when the dew glistens on the pearled ears, a shiver runs through the deep corn for joy. So, when they heard what Peran Visa said, a thrill through all the Tata squadrons ran, of pride and hope for Swarab whom they loved. But as a troop of peddlers from Kabul cross underneath the Indian Caucasus, that vast sky neighboring mountain of milk snow crossing so high that as they mount, they pass long flocks of traveling birds dead on the snow, choked by the air and scarce can they themselves slake their parched throats with sugar and mulberries. In single file they move, and stop their breath, for fear they should dislodge the overhanging snows. So the pale Persians held their breath with fear, and to Farood his brother's chiefs came up to council. Gudurs and Zora came, and Ferabars, who ruled the Persian coast, second, and was the uncle of the king. These came and counseled, and then Gudur said, Farood, shame bids us take their challenger, yet 
champion has been none to match this youth. She has the wild stag's foot, the lion's heart. But Rustam came last night, aloof he sits, and sullen, and has pitched his tents apart. Him will I seek, and carry to his ear the Tartar challenge, and this young man's name. Happily, he will forget his wrath and fight. Stand forth the while and take their challenge up. So spake he, and Firud stood forth and cried, Old man, be it agreed, as thou hast said, let Sorab arm, and we will find a man. Right. So, he is describing the uh, feeling of uh, the both the camps now, once this announcement was made, because the armies also didn't know. Uh, only Sorab made that proposal one to Paran Visa, and Paran Visa has now made it open and public. The moment Tatars heard this, there was a deep sense of uh, pride. There was a deep sense of uh, inspiration in them because they know that uh, Saurabh cannot be defeated on a one-to-one -one and uh, they were uh, looking with uh, a great pride and they were thinking as to who can challenge our Saurabh. On the other side, though all were warriors, a deep uh, shiver ran through them and that is beautifully given in that uh, metaphor. He says, in the great Himalayan uh, mountain, as the birds that they go there, they are flying, it is that, it is very difficult to cross over that. And various avalanches do come, however high the birds fly also, it just uh, finishes them off and uh, a series of uh, cranes are there uh, lying dead. The cranes go in a formation, but the moment they see all these dead bodies, they are afraid how they are going to cross. And what, see in the avalanche what happens is that you need to make one sort of a disturbance. And then the whole snow will come upon them. So they change their formation and go one by one. Instead of uh, trying anything, they themselves voluntarily give up their life. And how do they give up their life? They eat some big fruit, they themselves choke and in the process of choking they can't breathe and then they fall there. This uh, beautiful <laughs> metaphor he gives and he says, the Persians are feeling choke like those birds he said. He says, uh, it is a shame, also some few counsellors came uh, near Farood and said, uh, Gudurs and others, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a shame that we cannot, uh, it's a, it will be a shame that if we cannot accept this challenge. We have to accept. But we all know there is nobody equal to Sorab in our camp. He is young, but uh, he is like a wild stag. Nobody can match him. So what to do is a big question mark for them. And then Guru says that uh, last night only Sorab has also come nearby and he has laid his tent somewhere here nearby. Uh, I will uh, go and convince him. He will happily fight. He will leave all his wrath and anger. That means they know that uh, Rustum is in anger. For some anger or there it is there. But here is a challenge which he should not deny or he cannot deny. So I will go and convince him and uh, let him come and fight. I will make, we'll make him come and fight. So they make this announcement that let Sorab get ready. In the meanwhile, we will find our man. This they uh, talk back and they throw the challenge back and they say that they are ready for the challenge. Yeah. He spake and Piran Visa turned and strode back through the opening squadrons to his tent. But through the anxious Persians, Gudurs ran and crossed the camp which lay behind and reached out on the sands beyond it. Rustam's tent. Of scarlet cloth they were and glittering gay, just pitched. The high pavilion in the midst was Rustam's and his men lay camped around. And Gudurs entered Rustam's tent and found Rustam. His morning meal was done, but still the table stood before him charged with food, a side of roasted sheep and cakes of bread and dark green melons. And there Rustam sate, listless, and held a falcon on his wrist and played with it. 
But Budur's came and stood before him, and he looked and saw him stand, and with a cry sprang up and dropped the bird, and greeted Gudurs with both hands and said, Welcome, these eyes could see no better sight. What news? But sit down first and eat and drink. But Gudurs stood in the tent door and said, Not now. A time would come to eat and drink, but not today. Today has other needs. The armies are drawn out and stand at ease, for from the Tartars the challenge brought to pick a champion from the Persian lords to fight their champion. And thou knowest his name, Surab men call him, but his birth is hid. O Rustam, like thy might is this young man's. He has the wild stag's foot, the lion's heart, and he's young. And Iran chiefs are old, or else too weak, and all eyes turn to thee. Come down and help us, Rustam, or we lose. He spoke, but Rustam answered with a smile, Go to. If Iran's chiefs are old, then I am older. If the weak, if the young are weak, the king else changed me. For the king, for Kai Kusro himself is young and honors younger men, and he lets the aged moulder to their graves. Rustam, he loves no more, but loves the young. The young may rise at Surab's bonds, not I. For what care I, though all speak Surab's fame? For would that I myself had such a son, and not that slight, helpless girl I have? A son so famed, so brave, to send to war, and I can tarry with the snow-head Zal, my father, whom the robber Afghan specks, and clip his borders short and drive his herds, and he has none to guard his weak old age. There would I go and hang my armour up, and with my great name fence that weak old man, and spend the goodly treasures I have got, and rest my age, and hear of Saurabh's fame, and leave to death the hosts of thankless kings, and with these slaughterous hands draw sword no more. He spoke and smiled. The Gudus goes to the tent of uh, Rustum, and Rustum greets him. He is playing with a falcon, a bird, and uh, uh, now he greets him. He is unaware of whatever is happening in the battlefield. And he says, come, come, have breakfast with me. He has just finished everything. So he says, there's no time for that now, Gudur says. They have thrown open a challenge for one to one. And the champion from their side is Saurabh. And nobody is willing to take up the challenge here because they all know the power of Saurabh. So our request is that you must take it up. Rastum refuses. He says, why should I fight? I have given up everything. And for who? The thankless king, Kai Kusro. He himself is young and he has left the old warriors to sort of rot away. And he is only giving, uh, let's say, power and position to young people. And these young people, they are not wanting to challenge. It's a shame. And these young people may be, uh, their pride may be hurt. Uh, for me, it doesn't hurt anymore if anybody challenges and I don't go or go, it doesn't really matter at all. I also heard of the name Saurabh and he says that uh, the birth of uh, Saurabh is hit because they did not know who and how and whose uh, father, whose son is this and all, they do not know. But all that they know is that there is a great champion and he is coming and challenging. He said, if I had a son, he will be like Sora. I will be happily sending Sora on my behalf to all the battlefields because he is like a worthy successor to me. And then I will go to my aged father who is fending his flock of sheep and other things in his village there. With my name, I will protect him and lead a very happy retired life. Uh, his father is Zal. So, he is totally disinterested and he says, but unfortunately I have a girl. He says, that, that is the uh, tragedy. It is very interesting, at this phase we will stop. Because, how is now a disinterested Rustum tempted and persuaded by Gudurs to fight? That is very interesting. And then what happens in the fight, we will continue in the next class to see. No promotion, yeah. Oh, oh, oh,
namidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva vashishyate om shanti 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 hit